we kind of went through the Ramsey stuff, the computing Ramsey and, and that, that inherent stability and the advantageousness of, of doing this, this time inversion thing. Okay. Or going back in time. All right. Backwards in time. Um, and how, how that can help you compute things. And so basically what we did was, you know, start at steady state, but a little bit, um, displaced either down and left in, in both dimension directions or down up and right in both directions. Um, and then go in reverse time and you're going to, you're, you're going to converge onto that stable arm. Um, because when effectively when you reverse time, you negate the, okay. So remember, I, um, it, I guess I could have done a 3d visualization, but it, it's, it gets kind of dicey, but, um, you know, with these phase diagrams, you can always kind of think about them, I guess, gravitationally. Okay. So, so we have, usually we have these, this 2d space, we have these arrows, you know, that tell us where we're going and we can draw paths. You can think about the derivative, uh, functions as being, um, exemplified by a surface and you're rolling around on that surface under the force of gravity. And so if you have an unstable point, that's like a, a hill, the peak of a hill. And so if you're on top of the hill and you move a little bit, you're going to roll down the hill. If you have a bowl that's, that's a, and the bottom, if this is stable, you know, uh, manifold, right. You can, if, if you were somewhere on the side, you would roll down. Okay. Now, now with gravity, you get oscillations, right. But we're not doing oscillations here. Okay. So you just kind of roll down. So it's, it's not quite gravity, but it's kind of like it. Right. Um, and then with the saddle path, that's exactly why they call it a saddle. Cause that sort of, you know, manifold type visualization, uh, looks like a saddle. And so you have a ridge going down from either side. Okay. And then you have these, we, these off diagonals are sort of like these valleys where you just kind of go off to infinity. Okay. And so it's true that if you're right on the ridge, you're going to roll down the steady state, but then the ridge itself in either direction is unstable, right? So if you roll to the left or the right off that ridge, then you're going to diverge into those valleys. Okay. So I, uh, there's probably on the internet, some, visualization of this if you want to look for you know like the saddle point 3d visualization or something i'm just going to wave my hands furiously uh but those ridges are the stable arms okay and and they're unstable because they're ridges okay um but the the key here that when when reversing time that that anal analogous manifold you just flip it okay so peaks become bowls ridges become that like the well-defined valleys okay and so now when you're moving uh, uh, on that stable arm, it's a valley instead of a ridge. And so the stable arm is a stable area. So even if you're a little bit off that stable arm, you're gonna converge onto the, the bottom of the valley, okay? So um, it's hard to, my bra I can't, I, I don't know. I imagining in my brain, inverting a, a saddle path is actually fairly difficult. It varies probably based on how people's brains work, but that's that's an intuition okay um that you can think about uh uh about why is it that when you invert time that this set this saddle path becomes stable okay but the good thing is that if you make initial errors even substantial ones you're gonna after a little bit you'll converge back onto the saddle path which is which is an ideal property okay um all right so okay and then uh the next thing we did was you know um thinking about sort of actually traversing paths in the space. Okay. And the key here that I wanted to show you is that if you look at the line in blue, that's where you're continually using the policy function that you got from the, the previous computation. Okay. So that the, the output from the previous computation is saying for a given value of K, what C do I choose? Okay. And we kind of interpolated that at the end. Okay. So if you just keep using that at every point, you say, okay, I'm at K zero today. Here's my C that leads to some movement. I'm at K one tomorrow. I then go back to that policy function and choose that C and so on and so on. So I'm continually restabilizing, restabilizing myself. If you do that you know, by construction, you're going to, you're going to stay on the saddle path and go to steady state. The alternative is to just use the first, use the policy function just for C zero and then let the rules of the system govern it, those differential equations, like the Euler equation and the, the capital evolution equation. And so the only thing you're taking is that initial point. When you do that, the instability comes rearing back because you're always going to be a little bit wrong numerically at the beginning, because, you know, but when we represent real numbers on a computer, they're just, it's a grid, it's a very, very fine grid, but you know, 
you're not you don't get the exact right real number okay mathematically uh you get something very close to it um so that error is going to compound and then boom you go off in the red path right so you have to continually update these things if you want to get a, a proper stable outcome okay and then you and then the other thing i wanted to note was this that you can you can do other stuff like solo so solo rule is in green that's a policy rule too which is just a simple one minus s times output okay so um for consumption okay so um yeah and, and then this is where you can actually recreate those some of those diagrams that we saw in lecture uh just you know um green they're just doing the samples paths simulating them and then the red is is using that stable arm okay um all right so okay so that's that's kind of ramsey stuff all right um and that's that's Mm, this isn't highly optimized. In fact, this is the way I did it is quite slow and you, you wouldn't really want to use Python to do it if you were really concerned about speed. Um, we're not so much here because then the reason I say that is, you know, when I'm calculating stuff, I'm just doing for loops and saying, okay, you know, take K today, calculate, you know, K dot, C dot, add those on, okay, to get to tomorrow append that to some list and then keep looping. Okay. And it turns out that that's slow in Python because um, Python doesn't compile anything beforehand. It just goes through and it's like, oh, there's a for loop. And it goes to the end. It's like, oh, back to the top. And it's continually having to think about moving around in, in this, this space. Okay. Whereas other other things like um, uh, C or Ma even MATLAB um, and things like that will compile it uh, either ahead of time or just in time. Uh, and, and then it'll be like much faster. Okay. So, um, yeah. And so for that reason, generally, if you're doing stuff in Python, you want to do what's called, do what's called vectorize it. Okay. So you want to turn it into a, an operation on a vector. So instead of saying for each I in this one through N, take this vector, multiply it by two. And that's your output. That's pretty slow in Python. You say, okay, here's a vector from one to N of numbers, just multiply the vector by two and let something else figure it out how to do that efficiently. Okay. And that's what NumPy is. NumPy operates on arrays or vectors. Uh, and when you say, take this vector and multiply it by two, it goes underneath the hood and, and says, okay, well, we need to multiply this vector by two. We're going to call some underlying, you know, efficient routine that's already compiled in maybe it's written in C or Fortran or something like that. Um, and call that and it'll be fast. And it also like, it'll use, um, uh, your CPUs, uh, sometimes they have optimized instructions. So it, it'll, it'll, it'll go to town for you on, on doing that efficiently. Okay. And you don't have to worry about it. Right. Um, that's good because we don't really care about this stuff inherent. Well, we might, but most people don't. Okay. So, um, that's the idea. We want to vectorize. Okay. Um, now there's still the problem of, of like a, a loop, like this Ramsey thing, you, you can't vectorize it because you need to know where you are at time t to calculate where you go at time t plus one. And then to get to t plus two, you need to know t, t plus one and so on and so on. So it's inherently kind of recursive, which makes it a little bit harder to, it makes it kind of roughly impossible to vectorize efficiently. Okay. And so um, maybe we need a little, to think about that a little bit more too. So uh, what, yeah, so so the solution there basically is is there are ways to kind of compile things, okay, in Python, right? But again, we don't we're not really going to worry about the details. It's just we're just going to say compile this so that it's faster and it'll just magically happen, okay? So um, that's the good part. Okay, so uh, let's let's jump into this. Okay, so the the library you're going to be using, okay, is called Jax, J A X, okay, uh, coming out of Google, uh, DeepMind folks. Um, they were unhappy with TensorFlow for some reason, and they made Jax. Okay, um, and it's 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 kind of an ideal thing for thinking about things kind of mathematically, um, but also computing stuff. Okay, um, and it, it looks a lot like NumPy. All right, it, it implements it, it 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 mimics NumPy in fact, but it but it does the things that you're asking it to do faster, and it also allows you to take derivatives of of, of functions and stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so let me, but I'll, I'll go through a quick, uh, tour of kind of the features of Jax and what, what it can do for you. Um, and then we'll do a, like a value function iteration example. You can see how, how it works. Okay. Um, 
All right, so to do, to import it, you, you import JX, okay? That's the library. That's how you would normally import a library. There's also like this sub-module called NumPy, which is, it's like the NumPy clone, okay? But it's like, it's like, it has all the functions that NumPy has, but it's, it's, it's faster, okay? Um, and then I'm gonna import the original NumPy at, at T0, okay? So you can kind of, when you import libraries, you can name them whatever you want, okay? So I named it NT0 for the original, and then NTX for the, the fancy JX version, okay? Um, okay, so, uh, and, and basically what I'm gonna be doing here is just like, I'm gonna have some functions, I'm gonna compute them on, on random data, uh, random numerical data, um, and then I'm gonna take derivatives and, and, and stuff like that and compute the derivatives and so on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so then for the random numerical data, okay, I'm just gonna define that right away. It's just like a scalar value, 3.0, doesn't matter what it is really, it could be 3.1, could be pi. Um, uh, and then a, a, a array vector value, in this case, I'll just do a, a, you know, a vector from one to five. Okay, you can one, two, three, four, five. All right. Um, these are technically they're integers, but they're also real numbers too. So, but okay. Um, all right. And so then what we're going to do is define a function. Okay. So we're going to start simple and then build up. Okay. So we're going to define a function f of x, which is x squared, very simple function. So we kind of know what it's going to look like. And then we're going to evaluate. Okay. And that gives us nine, which is three squared. Okay. So I evaluated at our reference point xs. Okay. So that's gonna square it and give us back nine. Okay, so we kind of already knew that, but it's good to know that things work, all right? Um, one thing I do wanna just, I'm gonna add in a new cell here, okay? Uh, this is more a syntax thing in Python. So uh, if you um, wanna define a function, okay, you can define it, you can do def f of x and then return x squared and you can have multiple lines obviously uh computing stuff and then at the end you return something um that's one way uh the other way is there's a sort of inline way called a, a lambda function so i can define a function g and you just write sort of like lambda and the variable name and then you just write whatever you're returning okay so this is like a much more compact uh way to express the x squared function Okay, and it's gonna give me the same exact thing. Okay, so these two things are equivalent. It's just like different syntax. The lambda thing is is more if you have a, a short function that just like takes one thing and returns another thing uh, and, and so on. But you can put in here, you can put other functions. You can do complicated stuff in there. It's just like, it has to be like a one-liner basically. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll, you can use both of those and they'll be equivalent and Jax doesn't care, okay? All right, so then, um, yeah, so the first thing I kind of build as, as useful here is you can take derivatives of stuff, okay? And and so that f is a function, right? That's x squared, okay? Uh, so what we're gonna do is define df, the, the derivative of f, okay? And you just do jax library, look at the, the, that grad function, okay? And you call it on the function f, okay? So grad takes a function and returns another function, which is the derivative, okay? And then we're gonna evaluate that return function df that we assigned here, uh, on that reference point xs, and it should give us, well, you'll see it gives us six, which is two x, the derivative of x squared, because uh, x was three, two x is six, right? So that works, okay? It gives us the right answer. Um, you can do that ad infinitum, okay? Because df is a function, so we can call it grad on df and get the second derivative, d2f, okay? Uh, and evaluate that, and that should be two, that should be two, regardless, you know, the second derivative of x squared is two regards to the input. If if it was x cubed, it would give you the right answer and so on and so on, all right? So, and then if we did it again, if we did D3F, it would just always give us zero. So, you know, it doesn't, that's fine. Okay, it, everything works, all right? Okay, so that's kind of obvious stuff. We didn't really even need a computer to do that, um, especially because we're doing it for simple integers and simple functions. Um, but you can see you, you can put any, you can give that any function. Okay, like really, really complicated functions. Okay, so the, the application in deep learning is you give it a huge neural network, you know, with, with uh, multiple layers and different features and convolutions and stuff like that. And it'll just kind of work through iteratively chain rule and figure everything out. Okay, so here is super simple, but it, 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 can, it can handle almost arbitrarily complicated functions of, of a mathematical nature. Okay, 
Uh, although it does have to be, for grad, it has to be a scalar function. It has to be a function which returns one real number. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you want to do a derivative of a vector, that would give you back a matrix. Okay. And there's a, there's actually a Jacobian function in Jax that, that will do that. But, but for grad, it needs to be a scalar. Okay. Um, yeah. And yeah. And I guess, if, yeah. So if you wanted to compute a Hessian of the scalar function, you would grad it. I think this works. You would grad it. And then you would, uh, uh, Jacobian the grad, and that would give you the Hessian. Okay. So you can, you can basically do everything. Um, if you combine stuff. Okay. All right. So, so, but that's all scalar. All right. Scalar inputs, you know, especially with this value function and stuff, we're going to have grids. Okay. We may, uh, or we, we might have multiple parameters or something like that. So we're going to want to do multi, multi input things or vector stuff. Okay. So here, um, I'm going to find another a function known because it, I'm dealing in, in initially in the world, but we had, we're, we're only looking at scalar return valued functions. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do the sum of X squared. Okay. So the sum squares basically, um, and that'll give me, remember the reference series was one, two, three, four, five. So it's just, you know, this, the sum of the square of those things, which it turns out is 55. Okay. So that, that's just defining, um, a function again, this isn't even Jax. This is just, you know, using Python. Okay. Um, now, well, it is kind of Jax though, because, uh, we are using this NPX. Okay. So you can see here. When I did this function here, it just said 9.0. It was, it's a floating point real number. I should say floating point number. Okay. Um, the decimal number. Okay. Here I did it and it's saying device array 55 point type D type float 32. Okay. So now we're stepping into, into real Jack's array land. Um, so, uh, what this is, so it says device array, it, it's, it's a zero dimensional array, which is a, a number basically. Okay. So a vector is a one dimensional zero dimensional. is just a number with analogous to a point. Okay. Um, and, uh, it's saying device array because, uh, you know, the, the other thing that's happening in the background of the Jax is that it can live on your arrays can live in particular places. They can live on your CPU, like just on your regular computer. They can live on your, your GPU, your graphics card, or they can live on maybe a TPU, which is this fancy uh, thing, that processing unit that Google, tensor processing unit that Google makes and I think doesn't sell. Um, but, you know, so so the reason it says device array is that it's this abstract object that can live in different places, okay? Um, but again, that's all stuff that we don't really have to worry about, okay? All right. So that's kind of just replicating initial thing. Okay. And then what we may want to do is, is take the gradient of that, right? Okay. So now we're taking the gradient of um, a scalar function, but with respect to a vector. Okay. And so it's going to return a vector. So it's saying for, for X zero, here's how this changes the output for X one here. Here's how this changes the output and so on. Okay. Um, at a particular point. Okay. So remember that the, the gradient is a function that maps from the domain into the derivative value. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay. So then uh, we can do that. Okay. And we're going to get this. All right. So this is just calculating, right? So this is, this is, um, you know, the gradient of this function, what's that going to be? The sum of X squared, X being squared point wise. Okay. It's just going to be two X, you know, two x zero, two x one, two x two, two x three, two x four. Right? It's just going to be two x. Okay. Um, we're not interacting things, right? We're not multiplying x zero times x three or anything like that. We're just multiplying x zero times itself and then returning that. Okay. So, but in general, we could do interaction terms, and that would be fine. Um, okay. But here we just we you know we just have sum of squares. We're in, we're going to take the gradient, and it's going to give us that. Okay. So that's going to tell us for each element of X, how does changing that change this total output? Okay. So if you want to think about kind of just like thinking ahead, okay. So what, what kind of functions might we be using? All right. So in, in a, in a deep learning setting, they would be using a loss function. Okay. Of, of how well do we predict whether this picture is a cat over, you know, 
thousands of pictures or millions of pictures, okay, um, for our purposes, we might be saying, uh, okay, we have some parameters that went, that are, we have parameters, uh, you save this function, okay, we say, maybe we solve a model, uh, maybe we generate predicted output, okay, and then we compare how do this, how does that predicted output match up, say, in a sum of squares sense, um, uh, with the data, okay, and that gives you back one number, which is going to be oftentimes like a likelihood type number, okay? So so this function would be like mapping from the parameters of your model, taking whatever data out there is as given, uh, and then returning a likelihood, okay? And so when we take a gradient, we're saying, how does the likelihood change when we change, when we kind of fiddle with this particular parameter or that particular parameter, okay? Um, and so the, you know, the the gradient though is is you know one number for each parameter okay and then you would update it uh based on that okay so so that would be like a typical use case all right um okay so that that sort of gradients and and you know um here i can't do the the i can't uh do another gradient on this because remember gradient only works on on uh, scalar return valued function. But I, I guess I can, let me show you the Jacobian. Okay. Cause I, I didn't mention that yet. So we can cast, cast, call, uh, Jacobian on this gradient function. Okay. So here I remember I, I'm defining F these, the F in the vector sense of vector F function. The F V is the derivative or the gradient, I guess, uh, of the, the vector F function. So if I do the Jacobian, that should give me a, like a Hessian like thing, or maybe, maybe it's off by a transpose, but you should give me something, okay? And I guess I should, so it's a Hessian of FB, let's call it FB. And we're gonna call that on a vector, okay? The domain is XV, or XV is in the proper domain, okay? And we get that, all right? We get a matrix that's diagonal, okay? Now, Jacobians aren't always diagonal, but our Jacobian here should be diagonal because we're only doing pointwise operations, right? So uh, it, it makes sense that it's diagonal and the, that value, uh, there is the, the, sorry, the, the I, I said Jacobian, I guess it's, it's a Hessian at this point. The value right on those diagonals is the second derivative, which we know to be always two for X squared. Okay. So this makes sense. And I think this should work. If I do X one times X three, say our, our, our vector is of length five. Okay. So we have zero, one, two, three, four to work with. Okay, so let me just add in an interaction term and I should, and this, this should work. So the output changes because we're doing a slightly different computation. Um, <clears throat> the gradients are gonna change uh, for one and three, basically. So this is one, zero, this is one, and this is three. So they should have changed for that. And they did because this should have been six and eight, and now it's eight and 10 because we're picking up stuff. Okay, and then if we look at the, the, the Hessian now, we can see we've generated some off diagonal elements in particular at, at one comma three and also by symmetry at, at three comma one. Okay, so we've generated those those appropriate off diagonal elements from this interaction term. Okay, so like, you know, if you think about a regression, okay, uh, the, these are sort of interaction type terms. Okay, um, all right, so you can do all that. I mean, you, you can go, you can go as far as you want in that direction of, of taking derivatives, okay? Um, there's kind of two, well, two or three, okay, there's a couple of different concepts that I, that, I, that I want to cover. I think what I just did is probably the most important in the sense of, you know, you define this, this arbitrary function and you can get derivatives of it. And that can be really useful if you want to maximize that function or minimize it, right, uh, for optimization uh, using what's some variant of what's called this gradient descent, which is just a really simple, you know, Look at the gradient. It, you know, if the gradient's positive, go up. If the gradient's negative, go down in that dimension, and just do that for every dimension, and hopefully you'll you'll arrive at the right place. Okay, um, it's kind of a heuristic hope, but but hopefully you, you go uphill, you'll get to the top of the hill, right? Um, that's the logic. Uh, there's all sorts of things you add in momentum. You take a weighted average of the past gradients, and you know, there's many different. Like variants of that that the, that are coming from the deep learning world that that work better, but that's the basic logic. It's just you walk uphill if you want to maximize the function. Okay. Um, all right. So then, 
Okay, so I talked about vectorization before, right? It turns out that you can um, uh, you can you can vectorize functions. Okay, um, you can you can take that original f function that we defined for a scalar and say like basically map it over. Say call it if 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 I give it a vector now, it's going to call it individually on each element. Okay, and that's called a vmap. Okay. So you can you can basically I'm recreating F V and I'm going to call it F V two by 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 calling V map on F, okay, and, and giving it a vector value. So remember before, F only took a scalar. The original F took a scalar and returned a scalar. Now this thing is is vectorizing that F, and now it accepts a vec accepts a vector and it'll give you back x squared for each individual one, okay. As you can see, you know, one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared. Okay, so now instead of having to call it each for each individual one and maybe doing a for loop, we're just we've already vectorized it and it's sort of it's it's doing things efficiently. Okay. Um Okay, it's Zoom is telling me my my internet is not not doing well these days for some reason. Um I think it's because I had to move I had to, I, I moved rooms and the walls are weird here. Uh but Sorry, I don't know. There's not much I can do, but if, if it gets really bad, just just tell me, okay? But hopefully we can buffer things appropriately, or right, Zoom can, all right? Um, okay, so then uh, the other thing we can do is, so this first step here, I took f, which was a scalar function, and I vectorized it. So now it accepts vectors, and it, what it does is it squares every element of that vector and gives it back to you as a vector, okay? And on top of that, I can <clears throat> I can sum that vector. Okay, but here you can see I'm using this lambda notation. So um, I wouldn't you wouldn't call sum on a function, right? You can't sum a function. You can sum vectors, right? And if you have a function that returns a vector, you could sum that return value, right? So what this is doing is creating another function which takes x, which is a vector, okay. It it calls this vectorized f squaring thing on it, so it squares every element, and then it sums it, and then it returns that. Okay, so then I just did it in this lambda, this inline function way, and so what that what this thing in here is is just the sum of squares function, again, re-implemented with in a different way. Okay, and then I took the gradient of that too, because why not? I guess I could have done this. This this makes more sense if I do. Um, I know. Well, I don't know. Okay, we'll just. I, I could have defined it as a variable and then called grad on that function variable, but I just did it in one line. Okay, so, but but what that should give us, okay, is we we kind of recreated the sum of squares function by we had this scalar squaring function, we vectorized it, then we summed that as a function, okay. And then we took the gradient. So we should get back 2x for each one. We should get back what we had it, what we found for the gradient uh, back here. Well, before I changed things, which was 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay. So that, that this should be 2x for each one. And that it, indeed it is. All right. Okay. So that's VMAP. VMAP mm, it may not make sense now, but it actually is quite useful because you can. You can you can write logic that just applies for scalars and say I just want to do this a bunch of times or on a vector, and I don't want to have to worry about vectorizing my code. I just want you to do it for me, computer, and it'll do that. Okay, um, so it but it's not it it takes a bit of practice and sort of actually doing stuff. I think to really to understand why it's why it's useful and how to use it. But but just keep that in your the back of your mind. Okay, um, the last thing. Is 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 pretty simple though. Uh, I think it's just it makes things faster. You just call it on a function, it makes things faster, which is JIT. So that stands for just in time compilation. Okay. Um, can you guys hear anything? Are you hearing any background noise? No. Oh no, just you. Not? Okay. All right. It's my my laundry is doing stuff. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so. Yeah, so this is just time compilation. Um, I think it, I don't know, it's been around for a while. I think it was popularized at least with, with JavaScript engines and the browser where they'll compile the JavaScript uh, 
when you load the page and then when they call it later, it'll be faster. Okay, so, uh, but Jax does this and all you do is say, take that function. Okay, here, so, so here I'm using, I could have used any function. I decided to use the one we just created up here, but it could have been, you know, DFB, it could have been anything. Uh, in this case, it's the gradient of that, that um, sum of squares function that we made. Um, you call JIT on it and it just gives you back a faster version of that function. Okay. Uh, here, and so I just did that. Now, this is a very simple function on a, a array with five elements. Your computer is gonna churn through that in like, well, you'll see here, uh, a couple microseconds. Um, you're not gonna be able to see the difference if you're just running it here. Um, okay, especially pipe through the, 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 the lag of Zoom, right? So uh, we need to make this problem bigger and then maybe we'll be able to see the difference then. Okay, so here what I'm doing is um, instead of one to five and just having one, two, three, four, five, I'm going from one to five in even steps, but I'm gonna have a hundred thousand points, you know, one, one point zero 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 one and so on or whatever. Okay, so XV2 is now a hundred thousand element array. Okay, um, okay, and then, uh, yeah. And so what I'm gonna do here is just, uh, there's this time it function this, uh, it, it actually, even with a hundred thousand elements is, um, hard to see the difference, but if I do that a hundred times, which means I'm doing like 10 million, uh, actual computations, then we can start seeing it. Um, and, uh, yeah, let me, I'm going to run them twice because I'm going to burn things in a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. So that this has timing, um, 8.2 milliseconds versus, okay, the, the original DVF, okay. I guess I should, this shouldn't be a two. Let's do this. Uh, it wasn't a fair comparison. The original DVF, okay, uh, which is just the gradient of that vectorized function, okay. I'm gonna write it twice. Uh, it was taking about eight milliseconds. Okay, I'll come up with like the, the true, one true answer in a second. Okay, almost eight milliseconds, okay. Uh, to do that like a hundred times. So it's still pretty fast, but you, you know, these things start to matter when you get to more complicated problems. Um, and then this is 200 microseconds. Okay. So the microsecond is a thousand, a thousandth of a millisecond. So, uh, five times eight, it's like 40 times faster basically. Okay. So this is, uh, this micro is one in a million, milla is one in a thousand. Okay, so it's it's about forty times faster. If you just you just cast JIT on this function, I'm gonna say cast because it actually does seem magical. You cast JIT on this function, uh, and it gets forty times faster. No other work required. So that's pretty good, all right. Um, and that function was a gradient of some other function. Okay, so we like you can JIT gradients, you can JIT Hessians, you can JIT whatever you want. Okay, um, that's kind of the beauty is that it's very versatile. All right. Um, okay. So that's, I think, you know, gradients and JIT are the two most important things. If you take anything away from that, it's like you can, you can take the gradient of and pre-compile arbitrary functions, not just X squared, but you know, a very complicated function. Okay. Um, all right. And then the last, well, okay, there's, there's, there's a few more things. I'll, I'll go through these quickly. They're not, they're not, they're not critical. Okay. But they are useful. Um, one thing is, is trees. Okay, which are like, um, you know, when you have these models, oftentimes you'll have parameters in the update, like you have some alpha, you got delta, maybe you'll have a whole array of different possible productivity shocks, a probability distribution or something. You have arbitrary kind of like input parameters, okay? Um, and sort of jacks, you, you can make like kind of collections of those and just throw those all into a function and jacks will sort of figure out how to, to do the gradient right, okay? Um, you don't have to like, remember, oh, Delta was the first argument of this function and alpha was the second one. But then when you go call it later, you accidentally flip them with this. You can, you can say, create a dictionary here. I created X and Y, which are two different variables. Okay. And then F T, which stands for F tree, I guess, uh, sums up, it, it takes in this dictionary. It finds the X member cubes it sums that up, finds the Y element, squares it, sums that up, and returns the sum of the whole thing. So it's like, now you, maybe you have two different data series you're trying to match or whatever, I don't know. 
if for some reason you're cubing the difference, it doesn't make sense, but let's go for it. Um, you can do that, and what you call a grad on that, it'll give you, you know, another dictionary, which is the same shape as what you, your, your input, right? And say, well, the gradient of, with respect to x is this vector, because x was a, a vector of length 5. The gradient with respect to y uh, is this length 10 vector, because y was length 10 here. Okay, so it'll just figure out the shape of your input and give you gradients in the same exact shape as your input. And that way you can, you know, you don't have to have x and y, you can just have named elements, right? So you can, you can have, everything can have a, a name and it can be tracked by its name, which is generally safer, okay? Um, and you can nest it. You can have lists of dictionaries, of lists of dictionaries. You, you can do arbitrary nesting, and it'll just kind of magically figure it out. Okay, so that's it's actually kind of cool. It's it's not probably a hundred percent obvious why that's useful, but but it is quite useful once you get into uh, more complicated settings uh, with with a bunch of parameters and things. Okay, um, and then the last thing which uh, I'm going to use for this value function stuff, so I figured I had to kind of introduce it. Is is this really just a convenience thing? Okay. Uh, which is called partial application. Okay, so sometimes you have a function of x and y, and you want to create another function that just is like fixes y, right? So you have some general function f of x, y. Now you want to create some specialized function which still varies with x, but it's like y is fixed at three. Okay, that's partial application. You're you're partially applying y, but not x. Okay, um, so here. Um, Here, okay, so the, the, well, this, this starts to look like um, a production function, but it's not. Uh, but here I'm, I'm doing a sum of alpha, sum of alpha. So, so alpha, I'm going to partially apply to be two, which would be a sum of squares, but it could be sum of cubes if alpha was three, a sum of, you know, x to the 5.3s or whatever. So it's a generalized sum of, of powers, okay? And then that takes x and alpha. So x is the input vector itself that you're computing it on, and alpha is the power that you're sort of indexing things by, that you're raising things to. Um, and so then I can say, well, specialize this, create a, a sum of squares function from that. And what you do is you say, you call partial on that function fa, but then you say, well, alpha should be two. Okay, so it knows that this thing is named alpha. And so you just say like alpha equals two. And now when you call this new function, I guess I also took the gradient, but we could have just called the function directly. But, but, um, let's print it. It's the last thing when I when I compute the gradient, okay, and 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 at, at x v, then I get kind of what we expect that gradient of sum of squares, which we had before, okay, you know, which is the same, just two x basically, okay. So, so this should give us two x because we took the general sum of alphas function, we specialized it for alpha two, which means we were sum of squares, and then we took the gradient, and that gives us two x, okay. So so. Partial is useful. It's just like you're specializing general, more general functions. Okay. Um, so for instance, if you, if you have a likelihood function, which in general is a function of parameters and data, you might partially apply it on your actual data. And now you have a likelihood function purely over parameters, which is exactly what you want to maximize to find the, the, the best fit or you know, maximum likelihood parameters. Right. So that, that, that's the typical application. For, for us, I think. Okay. Um, all right. So then. Okay. So I, I'm. I got about ten minutes here. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is show you an example uh, doing value function iteration. Okay. So I'm actually going to do the. It, it's okay. So there's a. We'll see if I get through this, but. I'm going to do this kind of the simplest type of value function iteration, which it turns out is discrete value function iteration. Um, continuous is useful, but it actually, it's complicated oftentimes. Okay. So I'm just going to do discrete. So you can see I have a discrete time beta point equals 0.95 discount rate here. Okay. So it's, it's more what you would see in the previous term. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. And so what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, do this um, value function iteration. Okay, and just so you start with a guess. Uh, you compute the maximum k prime. Okay, you calculate the new value function, update that, and keep doing that until things converge. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to need one additional method, which I'll talk about when I get there, called scan, which does looping efficiently, and, and then but everything else should be uh, covered by what we've discussed thus far. Okay. Um, okay. So then, but then the uh, the parameters here are uh, so these are more like meta parameters, I guess. Uh, how many loops we're going to do? Okay. So with value function iteration, you can think about the number of loops as an algorithmic thing, or it's, I'm going to iterate 300 times and then hopefully at the end it's converged. Or you can think about a person that's living for 300 periods and they're getting something at the end and you're, you're backwards inducting uh, their value function. Okay, so that would be like a, a life cycle model, right? So they're basically roughly uh, computationally, they're, they're, they look very similar, okay? So I'm going to do 300 time periods. It doesn't mean you're living for 300 years. It's just time periods, okay? Uh, we'll have a, a capital grid of, of 100, okay? Um, and then uh, for the, where to put the grid, I'm going to just, I'm going to put it at like 50% of steady state to 200% of steady state. That's why I have 0.5 and 2 here for the grid range, okay? Um, parameters, okay, so here I'm, I'm putting them in a dictionary because it's like we might want to take a gradient of all of them at some point, okay? So, so I'm going to, and we might want to try different parameter values, but I'll have a pair of zero, which is like default, you know, 10% depreciation, alpha is 35, so on. Productivity is one, okay? Um, okay, compute steady state. This is, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, this is just computing steady state. We know that some, uh, we did, you know, at some point, maybe last term, I guess, we, we derived steady state in uh, discrete time, okay? So this is just like, we know this, right? So this is, we need to know, but we need to know steady state because I want to be able to center the, the capital grid around steady state. Okay, otherwise I'd have to choose arbitrary capital values and that may or may not line up perfectly with steady state, which is not a disaster, but it's not ideal. Okay, and then now what I do is I, around steady state, I create that 50 to 200% uh, grid range with 100 points in the, in the middle, in the branching through those. Okay, um, okay. And now I'm going to try to construct things uh, kind of semi-symbolically, okay? So uh, first I'm going to define the utility function and the production function, okay? So utility function is just log, okay? Although I am kind of bounding it because log of zero goes to minus infinity. I'm, I'm saying well, you can't actually go below a certain level, which is fine because we're not going to end up there anyway. Okay, it's just, it's, it saves you some headaches and, and some NANs later on, okay? Uh, then the production function, just standard, A takes K, the actual capital level, and then these parameters, Z, productivity, and alpha, your uh, uh, in terms of scale parameter, okay? All right, so now, um, okay, so this is where we need to bring in that one extra function for, for doing loops, which is called scan, okay? So what scan does is um, it 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 does iteration. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna create a function that maps from uh, like the old value function guess or the t plus one value function and returns the new value function guess. Okay, so we're just gonna create that one step. Like think about a proof by induction. We're just creating that one step, and then we're gonna pass that to scan, and it's gonna like figure out how to loop it and, and and potentially compile it and so on. Okay, so all we have to do is provide the inductive step, okay? And so this, this function right now is gonna take um, the parameters of the model, uh, the capital grid, okay? Uh, or actually a couple, capital grid and some other grid, grid st pre-computed stuff. Um, and then it's going to take this ST, which is going to contain the previous value function guess, okay? And then it's going to generate a new guess, okay? So in general, with scan, you, you have an old state and you generate a new state. In, a, in our case, it's just going to be a, a, a value function old mapping into value function new. But the old in, in, in the most general sense, the old state could be a, a tree of anything, any a bunch of stuff. And all you have to do is map from the old tree to the new tree. So you could have two different value functions or you could have a value function or a policy function or something like that, right? So um, we're, we're being fairly specific for this case, all right? Um, okay, and so then what do we, what we do is basically, uh, 
and the kind of the, the critical lines here are we're saying calculate you know utility of that particular consumption level plus beta times the new value function okay and we're we're for every capital today and capital tomorrow we have some we have a matrix of those values right so you have capital today which determines how much uh, you produce and hence how much you can consume potentially, uh, which is going to go into utility. And then capital tomorrow is going to net out of that to get you to consumption and also determine where you end up tomorrow. Right. So that's, and, and to know that value for tomorrow, that's where you use the previous guess. Okay. So we take ST contains the, the previous state. We, we take that VN, which is value next, I guess, um, here. And then we evaluate that VN uh, at K prime. Okay, so um, yeah, so being short on time, I can't go through the whole thing, but basically you can you can do it in such a way that you, you get this matrix of K, K prime, and, and then you look at the, the maximal choice for K prime. Okay, and so this is gonna, we're gonna get the maximal choice in terms of the location that you choose and also the maximum in terms of the, the value at that location. So there's the argmax and the max basically. This is not efficient. You can, cause we're kind of doubling our efforts here, but it's simpler. Um, okay. And then, uh, then you just find also, we, we find the capital levels. So this is like actual K prime rather than the index of K prime. All right. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, and then and we also compute the error uh, difference between the old guess and the new guess, which is for checking convergence, right? Um, and then what we do is we return that updated guess in, in this new STP, so it's state prime. Okay, so we took old state. Now we've returned a new state prime, which just has that new value function guess. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, so there's a couple of things I'm skipping over, but um, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll cover those next time. But for now we've created that iterative step. Okay. Uh, the end, you know, going from the old state, the old guess to the new guess. All right. All we're doing here is we're kind of taking and, you know, getting, pulling out these parameters pre, you can pre compute certain things on the grid. Okay. So you don't have to, to compute them every iteration. You can pre compute what is output at a given capital grid point, right? That doesn't depend. If that doesn't depend on the state, you can pre compute that. You can actually do it for consumption in the, in the matrix sense. Okay. So we do that. We actually partially apply those pre-computed values to the function. Okay. And so then this value one is just, um, just taking in that old state and returning the new state. So it's, it's really just, uh, that iterative step. Okay. And then, okay. So this is going to look a little funky, but basically we're calling there's more detail, but, but we're basically, we're calling the scan on that iterative step. So we're saying scan, keep scanning over that and do it T times, do it 300 times. And what we're going to get back is 300 value functions. So starting from the initial initial guess, which I just added is uh, appropriate utility, and then uh, iterating each iterative step up until the final guess. Okay, and we're not checking con convergence. We're just kind of doing it. We're doing it 300 times and, and hoping for the best. Okay, so that and that function is called solve, and so it'll take a parameter set. Okay. And it also take um, uh, the number of time periods that you want to go through, which is kind of a meta parameter, I would say. Okay, so um, all right, so we define that, and then we jit it. We pre pre compile it. We want this thing to be fast, right? Um, that's called J solve. We can just put a J at the front to indicate that it's jitted, um, and then we can call it. Okay, and actually, the first time you run it. It goes slower because it's actually doing the comp. It doesn't do the compilation until you actually run it for the first time. But then the second and on, it's much faster. Okay, so um, let's see how fast it is. Uh, okay, so it's a, this. Yeah, so this is saying seven milliseconds. Okay. Um, I thought that I did. Yeah. So you you can. Maybe I did it elsewhere. You can, you can, if you do this, you can do the exact same thing in basically regular Python with regular NumPy. It's about a hundred times faster if you do it in jitted Jax. Okay, so it's it's a substantial speed up to do this. Um, 
I guess I could just do this. Um, this is going to take. We're we're going to be done with class by the time this thing would finish. If I were to to if I just did the unjitted version, it would take a couple minutes. I oh, know it did. One hundred thirty-five. Okay, I overestimated things. Versus eight. So it, it's it's about fifteen times faster. Okay. A little optimistic, but it's still 15 times faster. That's pretty good, right? Um, that's the difference between two weeks and one day, or one day and two hours, right? So you can see that's that's substantial. Um, okay, and then, well, we're basically out of time. So you can plot stuff. Okay, uh, this is plotting the error. This is basically your convergence. You can see you in the logarithm, so you can converge. One thing is that Jax, um, by default, is in kind of a low precision, high speed mode, so you only get down to 10 to the minus six. Um, and then you can also plot, um, this is the policy function. This is, uh, this is well, this is k dot as, um, well, it's the change in k is a function of, of the capital level. So the steady state should be where that crosses zero. I guess this, yeah, what, k, k prime minus k basically. Um, that's where there crosses zero. Um, that's steady state. Okay, and then you can see the, the policy function. Now it looks discontinuous, it looks steppy, right? The reason is the pop that we're looking at a max on a discrete grid. So you kind of jump from grid point to grid point. You can interpolate. Okay, so if you do interpolation, it'll smooth this out. Not not ex post, but ex ante. If you interpolate inside that function, it'll smooth this out in a nice way. Okay, and when you do that, you can also take derivatives. Okay, so so the the next step after this would be make it interpolate, make it all smooth and continuous. And then you can take a derivative of the whole thing with respect to, say, alpha or with respect to z and see how does the, the value function itself change in response to these parameters by using jack grad, right? So you can, the beauty is that you can, you can take a gradient of that whole operation of solving the value function, okay? Which would be useful for estimating a model, okay? So that, that's kind of the end game is, is you make your whole model differentiable and then you, you, you maximize that.